So is D on there or what? All right, so where is she? Hey, I'm waiting on Diana. Where are you, D? I still don't get the hang of this, I guess. Hello? Yeah, I need a tech assistant. No kidding. Hey, we're waiting on D, right? Anybody got any questions while we wait for that dodo brain? <laughs> it's the nutsiest stuff ever, man. I don't get any of this. Come on, D. Where are you? How come none of this stuff is moving, huh? There's no...
Damn, man, I was waiting the whole time. No, 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 no. I was on. I was on time. No, I'm you weren't. A, I'm on schedule. I'm on. I'm on a schedule these days. No bullshit. I got. I got it the first time. <laughs> What's going on, Coach? What are you doing? Nothing. I'm just been waiting all week to talk to you. This is my highlight. That's a bad week. It is. It's. I feel like we've had a lot of bad weeks back to back. Um, I think it's starting to get to me a little bit. I saw that picture that you sent. You were holding Leo in your lap. The look on that, your face. Did he pee on you or something? You had a bad <laughs> look on your face. <laughs> that was that was a year ago, a year into it, and I still had no clue what I was doing. So I think I'm in the same spot, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you were holding him, and you're like it. I think he was holding me. Yeah, he might have been. He might have been. Hmm. What's going on out there? What's you the know, I'm, I mean, things are starting to open up. Uh, this week, restaurants have opened up. Um, our facilities are opening up on Friday, so we get to go work out and, and do that stuff. But I think the measures are still crazy. Like, you walk in, take your temperature, um, you know, sanitize your hands, one ball, one coach. They're going to time, space everyone out. I mean, it, it's still, I mean, it's still a weird time we're living in, right? I mean, you've been around a long time is this the weirdest thing ever we were just talking about bringing the kids back for uh, for summer school and they're talking about each kid has to have their own basket and their own ball like well what's the point well that's for these you kids know? that's no different though that's right right yeah well you know, since, since i've since since they need i've had uh, brian they need some Ed Bryan bands to get loose for a workout. <laughs> well, since I started Instagram, it's been kind of funny. If I see one more dribbling video, I'm going to blow my brains out. <laughs> I mean, they got these four-year-old kids dribbling with eight balls and golf balls getting hit at their faces. But, you know, they still dribble. They still dribble. I mean, it's bizarre. It's well, bizarre. you know, it's funny. When, when we get kids that did that in high school, then the first time you put a real person on them, they lose their mind. <laughs> Well, it's it's crazy. Penny and I and Sue, we always talk about individuals. I don't think I had an individual until I was like 25. And we talked about it a lot when, you know, we were on the Olympic team. It, it, that kind of stuff just didn't really matter or it didn't have as much effect on no. players as it does now. Um, and now, you know, it's all about, you know, how good are you in your individual? And then when the game starts, who cares, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I asked my players a lot, uh, a lot of questions about that. And I go... So let me ask you a question. That guy or that woman, whoever your trainer was, they taught you everything except how to win. Did they ever right. teach you how to win? Because the only way point. you learn how to win is you either playing one-on-one -on -one against somebody, playing two-on-two, right. -two, playing five-on-five, -five, which is what you guys used to do all the time. Well, I think, I think there's, there's a time for when I think you're – a little bit more of a veteran and you're, and you're sure the things that you need to work on. Um, there's a time and place for it. Like once right. I did start doing the, the individuals and really just making sure I kind of sharpened the things that I needed to get done, it did help me tremendously. But I mean, I'm talking about like 25, 26. I mean, these kids are doing it, uh, you know, they're doing it at four or five. And it's, it's crazy. You drive around the streets when I'm in LA, I don't see anyone at the park. No one's right. playing hoops outside. And you know, to be, it's not their fault. There's just too much, too much shit to do these days. That's that's true. That's it's true. Just too much stuff. And and everything's about uh, strength coach, conditioning coach, nutrition coach, <laughs> mind coach. Oh yeah, gotta get, yeah. gotta get, gotta get the mind right. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Um, uh, I mean, you know, everything's everything's changed the way. It's it, it, there's more attention put on all the variables instead of the actual work. Um, which, you know, I, there's a healthy balance. And I don't know if the scales are getting tipped the wrong way these days, even with, you know, all the scouting and analytics and all the numbers. And, you know, does it, it, it always comes down to two, three things in a game anyways. Like, you know, I, I, I like going left to shoot a jumper. I've gone left for 20 years. Good thing you have all that film, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really worked. You know, it's funny that, that you say that because uh, when I'll ask, some, I'll ask some of the players, what do you think makes somebody great? What do you think makes somebody the best? And 
some sometimes they think it's about points you score or how many highlight films you you create when you're playing uh how many all-star games you make and i try to tell them all the time i said listen you know what i you know who i think is great guys that you can't guard and guys you can't score against and if it's the same guy then, then you're, you're in trouble shit. that's you're right. in trouble and right. i think we've been we've been watching that for the last four weekends well i was just going to ask you like um uh, did how old were you when all that was going on well, I mean, so I was born in 82. So that's the 90s is when I really started loving basketball. I remember when they beat the Lakers, I cried for a week straight in the finals. Because, you know, <laughs> at, at that point, I still thought Magic and Worthy, all those guys were in their prime. I didn't know the difference between, you know, the 80s Lakers and, you know, yeah. the almost hang them up Lakers. So yeah. I thought, you know, we had this in the bag. We won game one. And then, you know, that famous layup, I, I, that, that's, you know, those little moments are cemented yeah. in your memory as a little kid. Like yeah. that one is a memory when Roberto Baggio missed that PK, that's another memory, like yeah. a sports memory that's ingrained in, in my mind. But, you know, that when you're young, you don't know all the drama with, you know, Scotty and, and Jerry yeah. Krause and God, yeah. just seeing just seeing Michael operate and, and all that madness, it almost made him better. That madness made him better. Well, you know what's funny? Um, you talk about that layup that, that Jordan made. Right. Uh, the other famous layup, in the NBA that everybody's seen is when when Dr. J comes from underneath the backboard and turns around. And that was against the Lakers. Lakers. Michael <laughs> Cooper. Oh, I know. I've seen it a million times. But, you yeah. know, it's so, um, you know, just watching all those Bulls and Jordan highlights, I mean, how basic were most of his points? I mean, just basic. And they didn't, they didn't blow people out. I mean, most games no. were, what? You, you, when they show the final score, they're like, they beat them by six, yeah. they beat them by eight, low scoring. I mean, it was just a different era of, of, of basketball, I understand. But Jordan made the – I mean, you always say when you can make the, 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 the really easy things look easy. That's right. That's, that's when right. you're a good player. When, what, you, when, you, when you dribble and then you can't make a chess pass, you're in trouble. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing um, is that back then – uh, there are teams shooting more threes in one game today right. than you might have shot back then in a month or two months. And they're shooting that many in one game. I mean, he was dropping 40 with all twos. Well, he's, 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 he's gotten 50, I think, seven times without making a three. That's impressive. I mean, it's crazy. That's right? impressive. Yeah. That's impressive. And shoot That's 50%. impressive. Uh, you know, a lot's been a lot's been talked about in um, in those uh, in those segments about his leadership style. Mm. And <laughs> I was uh, I was having this conversation with uh, with Sue recently about uh, everybody's got to lead their own way. Mm -hmm. So, what's the difference between Kobe and Michael Jordan? Oh. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's really it's really really close. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in in styles, not just you know, not their their game. I mean, you watch some of the you know the the behind the scene highlights of Kobe, and and you you're pretty much watching Michael. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> You know, it's they were kind of the same person. They they were very very close. I mean, think about think about Jordan doing what he did back then. Now, imagine imagine an NBA or a WNBA player doing what he was doing to those guys. Yeah, unheard of. There's there's no way. There's no way. Would you? How would you have responded to somebody who was uh, on your team that that was their style? <sighs> I mean, it's it's uh, it would be hard to play with someone like that. They would have to be so much better than everyone else, which he was. And I mean, Steve Kerr said it best when they, I mean, they were literally scared of the guy when he walked into the gym. <laughs> I mean, they were all scared of him, um, you know. And I mean, that was just his personality. Um, it was it was kind of interesting to watch how he how much he poured into it, but at the same time, he was kind of disconnected from the whole thing. Yeah. And that's I mean, that's just the the perception I get from watching. He was so committed to it, but at the same time, he was on an island by himself. It's 
uh, what he was going through back then is what social media became. He was like, it's like Michael Jackson, you know, uh, it, it, it just was bigger than anything anybody had ever seen ever in, in, in history. And that, that, cause imagine you, imagine if you were in that situation and every minute of every day you had to, you had to answer every question about everything and everybody. Every minute of every day. No, we were we were just talking about it. It must have been just so exhausting and draining. But at the same time, that was his – I feel like every press conference, everyone he talked to, that was just a little bit of fuel for him. Yeah. Just a little bit of fuel. And I hate people who say, oh, nothing bothers me. Shit, everything bothers me. For sure. <laughs> everything for bothers sure. me. Especially on the court, everything bothers me. You know, when you're on the court, there, there's this competitive – if you're a competitor, I know a lot of people, right. you smack them in the face and they don't care. And those people I don't understand. Right. But as a competitor, when you're on the court, like, I'm always trying to find something to get into on the court. But like, you know, what, 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 you know what can I get into? You know the interesting thing, D? You watch in all those interviews, he never lost his composure with the media. He Amazing. was never pissed. He was never, you know, rude, like blowing them off like they do today. Today, it's almost like guys are like, it's not my job to talk to you. Well, I mean, it it helped when his best friend was a Madre shot, and there was literally no. I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean like when you, when you come out, when you come out, and there's 55 writers waiting for you, right? And you know, he just he handled it. He, he handled it. He would, he would he would come out every single game, and and you're right. He held he he held his composure. He always. I mean, this is just such a fascinating documentary. Because the guy was just well put together. He was just, like, you just thought he was just an amazing basketball. He was, like, well put together. Like, he knew, he knew the things that he wanted to get done. Uh, I mean, he's just, I mean, uh, it's just cool to see it now, you know, 20 years later as, a, as an adult and after playing for a long time. You know, there's a lot of things that when you watch, you're like, I could relate to that. And then there's other things where you're like, ah, you know, maybe would have handled that a little bit different. Well, having watched that, how, what, what, how would you describe your style of leadership? Hmm. I mean, I definitely don't think I was as mean as him. I always say I'm a kind-hearted asshole. I think that encompasses everything. I'm a you're, half, I, you're half I, right. You're half right. I, <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the half that I, um, I, I, I do. Like, I, I feel like as far as being a teammate, I've always been d different as a teammate. Uh, I've always tried to be on everyone's side. You know, I've always tried to champion everyone who was on the team, no matter what. Um, and I and I did that as a little kid. And I think that's just the way we grow up, right? Like, you know, whoever's in your circle, you try to take care of them. That If they're in your circle, you know, that's part of the family. You take care of them. And when they leave the circle, watch your back. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just the way, as Italians, as Argentinians, that's just, just the way, that that's the way we work. That's yeah. just kind of the culture we live in, that, that we are. Well, a lot, a lot of people would not. Maybe they wouldn't believe this. Maybe they would. But I have never, ever heard you say a negative word ever about one of your teammates, either at UConn, on the Olympic team, the, with the Phoenix. It, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. I've never heard you say a negative word about a teammate. Even when I tried to get you to do that, <laughs> even when I would say, no, I can't believe this. You believe that shit that she's pulling back? And you would go, that's all right, coach. She's fine. You know, she'll be fine. Meanwhile, I know that the minute you left, you would go back to your room and go, coach is right, man. That's some bitch. I don't know. You know, because I, I, I mean, I don't want to say this because your head's big enough already, but I really learned that from you. And whether it's fake or real, you know, there's a lot of, you know, whether it's, I, you need, you need everyone in that group to be there, to be successful. You know, I just watched, the the O three finals that was on ESPNU and I hate watching old games. I hate I ha like I don't watch any old games, whether it's WNBA finals, whether it's Olympic finals, because I don't. Yo, we I don't were watch... bad. Yo, dude, we were, we were bad. We were terrible. <laughs> I mean, you look at Tennessee; they had six first rounders on the team. I know. I, know. I mean, I know. and they would just rotate them in and out, in and out, and we were just you know we were stuck with my girl Marie Conlon, who was smooth as <laughs> ever making everyone look silly, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was, it was interesting to see how, and I think that's a microcosm of, of just sports. You don't have to have the most talent. 
You don't right. have to have right. just which we did the year before, obviously with <laughs> with the four seniors. I mean, that was just such a talented team that play trying to play to a high level was our goal every single game. Right. Like trying to be the best team to ever play basketball. That literally, I felt like we never said that, but that's what we thought. If we can make the final four, maybe the elite eight, if we do, it's a good year. And then we were just, we were really just a really hardworking team. Like just watching the game, I was yeah. like, wow, we were just a good, good team. Like we were a really solid team. We you were always what? in help side. Just, just a more boxed out every possession. Yeah. Just to watch it was kind of, it was, it was nice to see actually. Uh, <clears throat> there was a time, and you say you're making this up, but I have proof. There, there was a time uh, during preseason, let's say, we always used to start practice October 15th, if you remember. Mm -hmm. That was always yeah. the magical first day. Yeah. Okay. So I remember it had to be like October 20th, 20, 25th. But sometime during those first two weeks of preseason, I remember standing there, and after one particular practice, in the middle of practice, I remember turning around and going, damn, I think we can be as good as we were last year. I couldn't wow. believe it because, like, everybody did their little part, and those little parts, you could see, were going to add up to a big part. Right. Nobody tried to do stuff they couldn't do. Nobody showed up during the – during practice and go, I don't feel like it today. Like, you know, you would never get A.B. or Jessica or right. Maria or any of those guys. And even Barbara, you know, those guys would never show up and go, screw it. I don't feel like playing today. Every day. Every day. And you kind of made it all work because everybody got to feel like, and, you know, people would, you know, get pissed off at me when I, when I said, you know, we have Diana and you don't. They didn't yeah. even know what I was talking about. Yeah. Well, it, it was, I, with, with our class, I think we were so desperate as far as, you know, Maria, A.B., Jess, Maria. We were so desperate to prove that we belong there. You know, it wasn't easy going into, especially in 2000, when we had, it, it seemed like, endless All-Americans. You know, we were sitting there like, are we ever going to play? Are we, like, are we going to be here for four years? Like, that was the – the feeling that we had as a group because everyone was just so much better than us, you know, as juniors and as seniors. And I think when they got that opportunity, they were like, we're not letting this go. I mean, did, did we have our challenges? Oh, we had a lot of challenges. And I think those came up the next year in 04 yeah. Yeah. where that team just was that whole year just seemed like a big struggle with injuries and, you know, the personalities that I think were a little bit shy to be who they were the year before all came yeah. out the next year. And, yeah. And, yeah. and and that was just a whole different different ball game. And that's what happens, you know. Um, you notice it a lot. And you notice that, I was telling somebody, uh, you notice it in the NBA a lot when a bunch of young players have a great year mm. and their team overachieves. The following year, it's like almost everybody had a meeting with their agent before the season and said, <laughs> yo, I gave myself up last year. This is my time. And as kids start to say that, woo, I mean, it just blows the whole thing up. Well, 2014, we go, we win the WNBA championship. We have a great year. Penny and I sit out the next, the next summer for, you know, whatever reason. And we come back with pretty much the same team two years later. And, you know, we're in training camp like, all right, we, we, it was the same team we had. Two summers ago, things should just, you know, go according to the plan. We get back on track. And, you know, we had the same top six or seven players. But, you know, the mentality was just different from a couple players here and there. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you're halfway through the season and you're 500 and you're asking, you know, different people to do different things. You have about 10 team meetings. That's, that's when you know the, the season's <laughs> over. The minute you have a team meeting and – um. You know what? I really don't give a shit what you have to say. I know. Oh, I know. but you know, team meeting, season's over. I know. Season's over. The minute or the coach, oh, we're gonna have a team meeting. Oh shit. <laughs> somebody, somebody said, and you know what's prevalent today? And I get that. I'm not making fun of this, but we're, you know, we're concerned with with players' mental, mental health. You know, mental well-being and all that. That usually 
it's, it's, kids. Coach, it's, it's, when, it's mental well-being <laughs> month, actually. <laughs> yeah. That, and I'm going crazy. It's like, it's like, um, when do you need mental well-being? Well, right now I'm in a bad stretch. I suck. So I don't feel good about myself. So I need somebody to tell me I'm great. Right. And you don't need, you don't need a team meeting for that. Just come in my office. I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you what's going on. But you have a team meeting and then they bring somebody in that's going to get everybody to hold hands and kumbaya and tell me your deepest thoughts and tell me how you really feel. As soon as that happens, I just get up and I go, that's it. We're going to be worse next week than we were today. They got to go. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, it's, it, it, everything's, everything's, everything has changed, even from, you know, being in the, you know, from school to the WNBA, um, just what I see from young kids, they have a hard, they have a hard time. They have a hard time getting stuff done, you know, things that are really hard. It's, it's hard for them to get through it without a helping hand here and there. And, um, you know, the times are just different. Um, it, it's different. And I'm sure it's different for you too. What, what you put me through, you're not going to put Paige through. I might. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't anymore. Like no, you, knew, I know. you, you knew back then. Whatever you said was gonna stay in gamble. Whatever it may be, whether whether it was out of line, whether it was whether it was right. Nowadays, you can't say anything without the whole world, you know, taking that little thing and and you know, and that's who you become. And it's sad because I'm I'm only picking Paige because you know she's gonna have a, a great future, but. You know, when you when you press someone, when when you really challenge them, you know that's when things are really hard. That's when Jordan was at his best when the Knicks challenged him, when the, when Detroit challenged him, when you know, those are, that's when you become really good. And and now we're just in an age of you got yeah. it, and yeah. and it's different. I, I I don't I don't respond well to that, um, for the most part. I, I you know I like to be challenged. Well, what ends up happening is um, what. If you're not careful, what society has done is they've legislated mediocrity. Mm. So what they've said is, look, everybody's going to be exactly the same. Nobody can stay longer in the gym because you'll get in trouble for keeping them longer in the gym. Right. Nobody can get pushed too hard. Nobody can be demanded. It just has changed in how you go about it. But at the end of the day, it's still the same things that you need to have to win. You can't, you, you can't show up and expect the other team. Although, I got to tell you, I don't know where this came from. But everybody's like so such good friends now. Everybody loves everybody. They play against each other. Yo, I'll hit you up later, man. Oh, yeah. hey, you know, but who, who does that shit? You never did that with the Tennessee guys. No, and I actually had some good friends on the, on the Tennessee team from the high school and All-American games. You know, that was one of my things about joining Instagram, I was like, well, fuck, I don't want to go like everyone's picture and shit, like, because I really don't care what they're doing. I don't care if they're working out. I don't care if they have a game tonight. I don't care if they're posting their own highlights. Like, I <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what's funny? Somebody just asked, somebody just made a comment. I saw it pop up. And it said, you can still challenge people, but you can't disrespect them. Well, I'm here to tell you that if I said to D, D, that was the worst goddamn pass I've ever seen in my life. If I said that to a different kid, they would go, why are you disrespecting me, coach? What? I didn't say you're, I didn't say you're a horrible person. I said that, that was the worst goddamn pass I've ever seen. If you can't handle that, what are you going to do when the pass you throw in a big moment gets stolen? So there's levels of disrespect when you attack somebody personally. Right. And then there's something else called I'm attacking what you just did. And well, a lot of well kids be, can't handle that. They can't they can't decipher the difference. Um and neither right. can parents, which is the problem too, I bet, right? Hey, <laughs> like best. do you think do you think I ever got the phone and called Lily and was like, Oh, coach today, he was really on me today. I mean, come on, like Did you I, did you guys have did you guys have cell phones? I got my cell phone sophomore year in, high, uh, in college. Sophomore year in college. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sophomore year. Well, you and know, the, now, two, the two best sets of parents I've ever coached in my life were your parents and Svetlana's. 
That's... <laughs> Svetas or lived in St. Petersburg. <laughs> and they coming over. No. And, they, and even if they call me, I don't have to know. I don't know a damn thing they're saying. <laughs> and your your mother and father, they didn't care, you know, about anything other than you were you were you were in good shape and you were in good hands and everything was going to go fine. And you're yeah. right. If something happened, if something was going on at school, you dealt with it with me or the coaches or the players or the right. teachers. We didn't get a phone call from home. Well, it's a, it's right now. We're just uh, there's too much of everything going on right now. You know, there's there's too much um, attention for these kids. There's too much publicity. Um, there's too much exposure. Like when I was when I was in high school, I I, I knew the kid in, in the next city that was really good. You know. Um, and now, you know, like you said, everyone's connected. Everyone knows each other um, a little bit more intimately and deeper than we did back then. Like, did I know there was a really good kid in Vermont? Sure. Did I know, you know, Sue was in New York? Sure. But like, that's all you knew. That's right. you didn't you didn't have these intimate life details of of their life every single day, which to me still is is pretty bizarre. Like the way people share on this thing, it, it's it's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's hard to find, like when you decide, not decide, but when you get a kid that comes in as a teammate at Phoenix, how long does it take before you can tell we can win with this kid? Or damn man, that was a bad move. I I mean to tell you the truth, it's been really we we haven't had a, we haven't had a group of rookies in a long time that have come in ready to play. Right. I mean I don't know what that's attributed to. I don't know if it's. You know the style of play is just completely different to, to college, or uh, but it's 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 been a little bit of a, of a shock seeing these kids come to the WNBA and have to learn so much about a game they've been playing their whole lives. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that I think the synergy between college and the WNBA can get a little bit a little bit better over the years. You know, and and I understand when you're in college, you know, you want the kids to do what what you need them to do for you to win, to keep your job. I, I mean, I understand those things, but, you know, at the same time, I think you have to get them ready, you know, for the pro level and, and for, uh, you know, a profession that they're going to have to be really good at to, to make a team, which is really hard these days. And it's going to get harder, especially with this year. With, with Who knows what happens if we have a season, we don't have a season. Do we have another draft, you know, next year? Does that push this rookie class out? It's, it's really strange. It's, yeah. a, it's a really strange time. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it definitely is. And um, that's one reason why I'm so hard on our guys that come in. They're supposed to be really good players. You know, like you get a kid that everybody says, this kid's all American, this kid's this and that. Well, you're in for, you're in for a tough four years, man, because I'm going to be all over you for all four years. Because if you come in with that mentality, like I'm the best player in the country as a, as a high school kid, well, then, if you ain't the best player in the country when you leave here as a senior, then I did something wrong. That's right. the way I approach it. And, I mean, you should. I mean, that, that, that's literally the only way to go about it. And, and if you don't do it, you're, you're, you're shortchanging these kids every single day, especially as a freshman. I mean, I was, I was scared shitless walking from, my, you uh, walking from my dorm you to been. Gamble. And the whole time I'm like, can his, just, can his car break down? Can he get sick? Can he just not show up today? Can, can, you know, it was just so hard every single night, every single day in practice. It was, and it was mentally hard, you know, because when you come in as a high school kid, you know, you, like you said, you're in high school, you can do whatever you want. You're playing against, 90% of the people you play against will never play basketball again. Right. So that to me, what you do in high school really is irrelevant. And to a certain to a certain point, what you do in college to me, you know, we've had a lot of people have a lot of success in college, and it doesn't translate into the right. WNBA because right. now you're playing against people older, stronger, smarter. Yeah. And if you're not at that level when you get there, you're gone quick. Yeah. And that yeah. aura of that you're the shit is gone quick too. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> something came up also. Um, players are going to get paid now in college. Well, they're not. It, just so everybody understands, they're not getting paid. Okay. They're not getting paid by the colleges. They're getting an opportunity to make endorsement money. But that wasn't around when you played. And you made a, you made a comment one time. <laughs> oh, you saw that. You were on Instagram. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, no. It, it, I read it. You made a comment <laughs> like, hey, man, you know, <laughs> they're still making money off my shirt. And they I are. Anything. And I'm thinking, first of all, there's no names on the back of the shirt. So that's number one. Number two, you made more money your first year in Europe than all the shirts that will ever be sold about you for the rest of your life. So I don't want to hear it. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I said that obviously kidding. It would have been nice to make some money in college. I mean, I think yeah. like anyone who's in college, I literally used to beg my mom to put a hundred bucks in my account. Like, you know, that's what we were talking about. You know, right. can I get a hundred bucks so I can go to the movie so I can go to the right. mall? I mean, that's, that's how we were living at the time. That's, that's what, that's how college was set up. Um, I think it's going to be benefit college. I really do. It, it, and, you know, maybe not women's as much, but I think on the men's side, it's really going to benefit them. You're talking about a guy like Zion who got paid anyway, apparently, but <laughs> say that guy can get paid a little bit and he really likes college. He'll stay an extra year. Like you're not that desperate to go make money. And, um, you know, it really hasn't happened on our side much. Um, you know, there's there's a couple kids that left early. Well, maybe if a kid like Satu could have got, you know, some money here and there, she would have stayed an extra year in Oregon, which no matter what anyone says, when when you are the man in college, that's the most exposure you'll ever get. That's right. one th that's one thing that hasn't changed. Like, we'll, we'll walk around and, hey, UConn. It, I mean, we're talking about 20 years later, and they're still talking about Connecticut. Right. So, like, that's still – that type of exposure, you'll you'll never get in the WNBA. You'll never obviously get it get it overseas. So that that to me still is the biggest player in our game. Um, <clears throat> how would you feel if you were on a team in college, and you were getting X amount of money, a lot, and nobody else on your team had? It would be almost like the pros, where you know if if Michael's George, if Michael Jordan's doing 10, 10 commercials uh, when he's with the Bulls and nobody else is doing any, do you feel like because college kids aren't mature enough yet, would there be some resentment there among the players? Oh, you mean it's like real life? Real life, yeah. Oh, it's like real life. So yeah. the people who do the most and, you That's know, right. they, they get the most? That's right. The American dream? That Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know what? Okay, so when we went to college, I just watched that game. They had that camera on me for two hours straight. Did I mean, did Barbara care? Did Ann care? They might have. They never said anything. Did Maria care? I mean, you know, they get it anyways. I mean, obviously not monetarily, not money-wise, but they get the attention, the interviews. Um, you know, but I'm telling you, when, it, when, I, when you go to the co-op and there's a number three jersey there, you know, there's a 10, a 50, and then they got some quarterback that used to play. That. I don't know his name anymore. I think he's I think he's a better sportscaster than quarterback. I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, um, that that is definitely true. That's definitely, that's definitely true. <laughs> that is definitely true. Um, you know, it makes you wonder. It makes he, you wonder. And, no, he was he was in the. We're talking about Dan Orlowski. He was in the NFL for twelve years, and nobody could spell his name. And now, <laughs> after like six months on ESPN, he's the second coming of Tony Romo. It's oh man, he's he's like he's like this this hipster Jesus from Connecticut that has saved ESPN. Amazing, he's amazing. He's really good. He's really good at his at his craft. He is great. He is he's absolutely great. He's absolutely he really great. Is. It, it's nice. It's nice to watch someone on TV who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which we yeah. know a lot of people on TV these days just you know they they seem very uninformed, but he just knows. He just knows what he's talking about, and, and it's nice to watch. The, um, you know, you mentioned something about the season. Maybe there's a season. Maybe there isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. What were, what were your initial feelings when they, when they canceled the oh. uh, postponed? I should say, the Olympics. Post the Olympics. I mean, I was, I was obviously, I was disappointed. I mean, I, you can see it coming. There was just no way you were going to be able to hold the Olympics, bringing that many people together, especially how, you know, how uncontrolled, you know, that whole situation was. I mean, I was, I was disappointed. Um, I think the one thing that I've learned the most in the last couple of years is how much playing and trying to stay in shape and with injuries, 
you know, a year from now, who knows? I might not, a month from now, I might not be playing basketball. Like, I just don't know. Right. Um, and I think every, when you get to my age, when, it, when things get put on hold like that, it just makes it a little bit tougher for us to, well, for me personally, to, to, to stay ready for when, when it will happen. And now it sounds like it won't even happen next year from, from what I hear. So, um, really? yeah, I mean, I, I just don't think, I don't think anyone's going to be able to handle that many people coming in. Um, right. And, you know, and the same with the WNBA and the NBA is, is the reward, you know, bigger than the risk. Like, can they, can, can, as a league, as a business, can you tell me that I'm going to be safe? Um, and the way this thing spreads, how can you do that? I, I, I don't know how they can do it. I mean, how, how do you do that in, in, in the college world when you have, you know, thousands of kids on campus? You can't control their every move and, you know, right. who they see, who they don't see. That's what's tricky about this is it's one thing if I just got it and it, and it stayed with me, but. You know, your irresponsibility affects me and then affects my family and then affects old people. Yeah. Yeah. If I, I wouldn't want anything to happen to your parents. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, they're vegan. They're good. They're good. Yeah, they're vegan. <laughs> <laughs> they're vegan. You should have uh, seen my dad the other day. My mom took a picture. My dad's out there with, you know, 24 chickens on the barbecue and, with swords. And I'm like, man, things have things have change for me but it stayed the same for them absolutely why should they change why should they yeah. change why they're should happy change? they're the happiest they're the happiest couple ever and they shouldn't change one bit well lily's um, happy i don't know about mario yeah 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 <laughs> yeah <laughs> have you how have you guys been have you guys been you guys just been at home yeah have you been yeah, able to go work. on campus just at home yeah, I mean, if I go up to campus, there's nobody up there. So, right. you know, you just go up and um, pretend like it's like a normal day or pretend like you're doing something. Um, but, but, yeah, you don't go anywhere You uh, for the longest time. Now, we're, we're supposed to be doing something on the 20th. They said the state can open on the 20th and do some stuff. Um, but up till now... You know, you're not going to any restaurant. You're not going to, you know, anything where there's going to be um, any kind of a group of people. And right. um, so it's, you know, it's been the same for everybody else. But uh, <clears throat> some, pla some places are, are dying to open up and people are running out in the streets like, you know, uh, they've been let out of jail. Like it's a jailbreak. And next thing you know, they're everybody's getting sick again. Well, I mean, it's it's you know, I have conversations with friends and families, and you know, we're we're in a position where you know we can stay home and we'll be okay financially. Yeah. You know, and then and then there's that other side of you know, if you're telling me that it's okay to go and work, I need to work because cool. I need that paycheck. I mean, there's that side of I think <laughs> this problem that. It's easy to say, oh, just stay home. But if you literally don't have money, right. <laughs> which a lot of people are, are, are living check to check in this country and around the world. Um, and I'm sure you did when you were younger. I know when we were in high school, it was check to check. You know, mom right. and dad didn't go to work. There was literally no money in the bank. Um, right. You know, it's, a diff it's, it's just strange. But you're right, though. People, you, the minute you give them an inch, they're at, you know, they open Newport Beach for a day and there was thousands of people like you know life is normal um and they're just asking you to sit on the couch like you know they're not asking you to grab a, a musket and run into a trench <laughs> like sit on the couch shut up and watch netflix you know it's the only it's the only time where you'll be a prisoner of war and come out fatter like you'll be okay for you guys, it's like being back in Russia, huh? To to practice, you would literally do that. You'd come back home, and there was one other person you talked to. And that was usually for me it was obviously Sue because we're on the you know the same team forever. And and you know it, it's it's not you know when people talk about Russia and how how much time we spent there, and you know they hear all these stories and you know all the parties and the great games and for you know. For every night we had 
you know, a dinner party with the team, we had 40 nights where 40 days where we didn't talk to anyone. We, we like, we literally couldn't speak the language of, of anyone else. And, you know, a lot of it was, was being, you know, an apartment by yourself, a lot of nights by yourself. What is the, um, <clears throat> how, do, how does, how does playing over there when all that time that you were there, how does that compare to playing in the WNBA? It's just a different world. I mean, you know, when we play with the Olympic team and we've gotten to play in some cool places, um, it's just a different world. It, it, I, I said it before. It's so you play here domestically. You play in Russia, and you kind of get the feel for you know how Russians play. Um, and then you know you go to Italy and play in Italy, and they play a completely different style of game. And then the next week you go to Hungary, and then the next week you go to Slovakia. Um, you know, and and these are places with a lot of pride. It's it's literally their their home country against yours, which you know at the time was was Russia. That's what you know. That's what I was representing. But you know the game was totally different. It was a uh, it was officiated differently. It was played differently. Um, it, it made you, it, it, this is what I tell kids, you have to go and play. You know, at the end of the day, if you're not playing, you're not getting better as a basketball player. You know, there's, there's not many people that I know that have taken a lot of time off and come back in better shape or a better shooter, a better ball handler. You know, basketball is read and react. You know, how many situations in a game can I read and react faster than you? You know, you might be quicker than me. You might be able to jump higher than me. But, you know, can, can I sniff that out quicker than you? Um, and that only comes by playing. It doesn't come by doing ball handling drills. It doesn't come by anything else but actually playing. And, uh, and I think that's maybe hopefully where basketball is, you know, trending as far as, um, you know, the game. Kind of going back to, you know, what, it's funny. I always talk about you, Coach. There's, it, it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> but it's principles. It's, you know, it's, it, there's certain things that you have to do every single day. It's not how much, you know, it's not how many things you can do, you know, it's how well can you do these, you know, whatever it may be things that can you do them every single day. And, you know, that's why the WBA is so hard to win. Cause you just, you don't get that type of commitment mentally, really, you know, everyone's off in their own world and um, you know, other things are important. So, <clears throat> what would you like to see different in the WNBA in officiating other than not having any of them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, look, I know I'm, I'm, I'm their hardest critic. We know it's a hard, it, it, it's a hard job, right? We know that. Um, I just think, um, in Europe, the officials are terrible, but they're consistently just terrible, and you know that. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you're consistent at anything, you can accept it. You know, uh, uh, when you coach players, if you know someone is consistently bad, where well, you're like, well, shit, they're just bad, or they're good. Like in the WNBA, I think there's just been so many different times where they want to change rules, and you know, to be honest, um, we talk about accountability all the time, and I don't know, as as a as officials and you know, as the WNBA, if, if they've been accountable to, to these officials. And I think it's been unfair to them more than anyone. Hmm. Huh. So when, when they go back and, um, and look at some rule changes, what rule changes should they make? Well, I think, I think it's time to pull the three-point uh, line back. I think they should start there. I think we need we need more space in our game. You know, players are getting bigger. I think we're getting to a point where um, I think the how dynamic people are. I think that would help. Mm -hmm. I you know, there's a rule that we always talk about. I think they should pull it back to five fouls. Yes. You know, six is six is way too many. Six, you could just foul all game and you're good. Um, and you know, and then you bring bring the next schmuck in and they can foul six times and then you bring in some other schmuck and they can foul six times, um, you know, but then the flip side, the, the, the counter argument to that is it puts too much pressure on the officials. Well, there's the same kind of pressure in the NBA because they're playing, they're playing the same number of minutes relative to how many fouls they have. Right. They play an extra eight minutes. Right. 
and they have oh, yeah. an extra foul. Right. So pressure's on everybody. But you know what? The pressure's also on the player. Don't foul. Don't foul. I, I mean, agree. Nobody's committed more dumb fouls than you in the history of basketball. Where you, you know, just... I, hey, look, I say one thing. When I foul, I foul. I don't make any mm -hmm. – like, when I foul, I foul. I'm good. I was just talking about the day. The only time I get technicals is when they foul me and they don't call it. Yeah, that's true. Like, that's, that's the only true. time I get teased. Like, if I, when I foul, I don't think I've ever complained on a defensive foul. I'll be like, yeah, I fouled the shit out of her. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh well so other than moving the line back anything else i mean up? this this might be controversial i would Our like lines. to go back i just don't understand you know I, I don't know if it was a fiba thing a WNBA thing i think you know the ball was one thing that made us kind of a universal sport no matter what you right. know the lines here there you know, in high school, it, you know, the, the three-point lines of certain distance in college, NBA, WNBA, Europe. You know, that was one thing that, you know, I think you can move on, but the ball was the ball. Yeah. You know, like we talk about volleyball and the Nets higher. The volleyball ball is the same. And tennis, you know, the racket or the tennis ball is the same. I don't know. I, that was the one thing that I never understood when they changed it. And they changed it after we played that one USA basketball in 1999. That was the last time we played with that ball. Yeah. Well, you know, um, if you want to, if you want to say, women athletes, basketball players—they're bigger, they're quicker, they're faster, they're stronger. They've evolved. Then why do we still play with a with a ball that high school kids should be playing with? Or I agree. Why, why in Europe do they do they uh, did, did they play with the bigger ball? We made them change. If we'd have held on just a little bit longer, they would have changed. You know what I'm saying? So I agree. Yeah. Now that one to me, the one when that happened, that one to me was was confusing. Because even now, when I go, you know, I try to go find a ball. We have seven to six. If I don't even fucking, know. I mean, what, what size ball do we play? In? I don't even know. Yeah. I think that was. I think that one was. We should have negotiated that one. That one should have stayed the same. You know what? Uh, in the three on three competitions, I brought this up. So naturally, they won't do it. If somebody else brings it up, <laughs> they would do it. But because they'll say this, this got to be this got to be good for Connecticut. So we ain't yeah, doing this all oh, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, in the Absolutely. three on three, the the uh, they use a ball that's the women's ball, but it weighs as much as the men's. Do both men and women play with that one? Yes. Well, I do think our ball's too light. Like when you watch our games, oh my God. when you when you miss, there's rebounds going everywhere. Yeah. When you watch when you watch the NBA, every single rebound's at the rim, a foot from the rim. Yeah. You know, when the ball, I mean, it, it makes a difference in that, style of play. That shot that Kawhi Leonard made from the corner. Oh. One, two, three. Oh, you will never ever see that in the women's basketball game. No. That ball will hit the rim and be out of bounds. No. No question. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they made that that change with the but ball. But they can do it. They they have the the ability to do that. Same size, just make it way the same as a men's ball. There you go. That's they the probably won't. They they have too many balls with the WBA logo on them already. Just selling like hotcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Sold out at every Target. <laughs> uh, hey, what? Tell me about the uh, – because it was one of my favorite times ever. Uh, that was unbelievable. That was um, that was the best Olympic team I played on. Um, 04, 08, 12, and 16. That one by far was the – that was the best team I've ever played on probably. You know, there's a lot of times when you get those teams and there's people, you know, kind of at the end of their careers, you get some young kids, and then I think at that time, time you can probably say every single player was in their prime mm -hmm. every single every single player was you could say was was at the height of their career um mm -hmm. and you know just the the way we played the you know the way everyone got along there was just maturity about the team yeah. um you know it was just it, and, and it was great every every single game um we couldn't wait to, to play you know yeah. you know how those you know sometimes 
sometimes, you know, those, those three weeks can get long and they can get taxing on you mentally. But, you know, for those three weeks, man, we can, uh, you can wait to wake up and, and see the next person, you know, whether we on the boat or on, on the bus. Um, that was just a, everyone's mindset was where it needed to be. And that's, that's why we just, I mean, we played amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And no, that was, that scene was unbelievable because um, the further we went down the bench, the closer we were getting to Diane, um, Stewie, and Elaine. I know. <laughs> unbelievable. I know. It's unbelievable. I, unbelievable. Scratch the surface of how yeah. good you know she is now and and is going to be. Uh, that was just a that was that was fun. That was a fun fun Olympics and you know hopefully we get to do another one. But who knows? You know someone asked me the other day, what if you don't get to the fifth one? And I'm like, you know I've played in four Olympics. I, <laughs> if I don't get to the fifth one, I'm not going to lose any sleep. I, I'm just not. Yeah. Well, you've gotten four more, more than ninety nine point nine percent of the kids that ever played college basketball or high school basketball or any kind of basketball. So, mm -hmm. um, All right, coach. Coach, say you were a 22-year-old coach right now. You can't pick UConn. What would be the one job that intrigues you the most in women's college basketball right now? Um, I, I don't know. I think it would have to be a place, to be honest with you, I would want to be at a place that had a really, really, really good men's basketball program. Because that means if they can do it, then you ought to be able to do it. So I would want to be at a place like that. And I would want to be at a place that nationally everybody knows, like, yeah, that's a great school. What's that so, look like? So, huh? What's that look like? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, if I was that young, uh, when I was at Virginia, I thought that had a chance to be one of the best jobs ever, ever, because mm -hmm. of the school, where it was located, um, now the facilities, but places like, places like Virginia, places like Duke, uh, you know, North Carolina, places where you know basketball is really, 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 really important. Right. You know? Um, I, man, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I don't know that I'd be able to pick one. Hey, when yeah, I was... but but then on but then on the flip side, what really really good women's basketball college has a good men's team right now? It's kind of it's kind of like if you're if you're really good in women's basketball, you're kind of the team. Yeah, yeah. I like mean, if you think about be... you think about Oregon, you think about Mississippi State, you think about us right now. Um, you know, Louisville, we're kind of the ones. Yeah, at that school. But at the same time, you know, because a lot of those schools have football as like trying to win the national championship in football. Right. So, you know, our football program isn't isn't that level. So, so basketball is the number one thing here at the school right now, you know, and it probably will be. But, you know, like some. You know, that didn't take long. Okay, yeah. South Carolina people, South Carolina. You South happy? Carolina. South Carolina, of course, South Carolina. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> we're, we're talking about places where, you know, uh, basketball, you know, men's basketball is, is what, what drives the, the, the bus. And, um, and, and you're right. They're, they're just – there's not enough. There's not enough. There's not enough schools where uh, either – Either the school's great and the coaching's not, or the coaching's great and the school's not. Right. It's hard. It's hard to have those 